Okay. Um, on behalf of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at UNC and also our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, which I chair, I, I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Marissa White. Uh, I will give a little bit of background for Dr. White. Um, she received her um, bachelor's degree at the University of Richmond and then her MD from Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. She then went to Johns Hopkins University where she did her residency in anatomic and clinical pathology, followed by advanced specialty training in surgical pathology. Um, and after finishing the training in 2018, she joined the faculty as an assistant professor of pathology. Um, her clinical interests are, are in breast cancer pathology, but she's here today because of her, her equal interest in um, training and teaching uh, pathology faculty and pathology departments in general about the value of increasing diversity, um, equity, and inclusion and as establishing that as a important um, key to um, the curriculum in uh, pathology departments, not only at Hopkins, but across the country. Um, before I, I finish introducing, I, I'm gonna use this opportunity for a shameless plug that this is going to be a great introduction. In two weeks, um, we will have a panel discussion for all our faculty, staff, and trainees in our department um, for Grand Rounds on June 4th, and we hope everyone will attend. So uh, it's my pleasure to have Dr. White join us, and she's gonna talk about empowering change, effective strategies to improve diversity, inclusion, and equity in pathology. Well. Thank you very much, Dr. Weissman, for the warm welcome. And it is incredible to see how many individuals have logged on from around the globe, literally. Looks like we have some individuals from the UAE, the West Coast, the South, the Midwest. So thank you for logging on. Um, so we'll get started. Um, so again, um, this morning, I'll be speaking about empowering change, effective strategies to um, improve diversity, inclusion, and equity in pathology. And I'm using the word change because remember that diversity is change. We're thinking about you know, what things can be if you bring new perspectives and new fresh um, perspectives into the flow. So hopefully um, by the end of today's talk, uh, you'll recall the term underrepresented medicine as defined by the Association of American Colleges. Um, describe the historical and current distribution of individuals underrepresented in medicine, both in training and in practice, with an, with an emphasis obviously on pathology specific data. Recognize how the barriers to retaining individuals underrepresented in medicine may evolve at each new stage of their education and career. And then finally, outline the key elements for an impactful diversity, inclusion, and equity initiative. But before we go any further um, in our conversation about diversity and change, it's always important to take a brief step back to understand the past so we can fully um, understand where we are today and where we need to go. So for our conversation about diversity in medicine in the United States, recognizing that we have an international audience today, um, I think we all understand the implications of the 1896 uh, U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws for public facilities in the United States, which included hospitals and schools. But while modern evidence-based medical education is directly attributed to the Flexner Report, um, unfortunately, uh, this report had some inadvertent complications um, and impacts on medical education, uh, specifically as he addressed the medical education of women and African Americans in chapters 13 and 14, respectively. So as a reminder, Abraham Flexner um, held a Bachelor of Arts in Classics from Johns Hopkins, um, and he published the results of a comprehensive 18-month survey of the 155 U.S. and Canadian medical schools. And the survey was commissioned by the American Medical Association's Council on Medical Education, which at the time sought to reform U.S. and Canadian medical education, which to some extent was for profit um, and, ha and was not as rigorous as it could have been. So this report by Flexner was well recognized and remains well recognized as the driving force behind the standardization and improvement of medical education in the country. 
However, again, the less frequently discussed consequences are of chapter 13, the medical education of women, and 14, uh, the medical education of uh, African Americans, which we'll discuss in greater detail. So chapter 13 briefly touched on the medical education of women in the early 20th century. He noted that female student enrollment was declining and commented that, quote, now that some women are freely admitted to medical profession, it is clear that they show a decreasing inclination to enter it. He also stated um, that the women's choice of medical school was free and varied and, had, and women had an assured place in certain medical specialties. Um, and again, this unfortunately assumed that co-educational medical schools would admit uh, female students on an equal and equitable basis. So he ultimately concluded um, during his review of the women's colleges that were um, open at that time that none of the three women's medical colleges existing at that time could remain open without significant overhaul. Um, recommending that they be closed. But again, there was no assured mechanism in place for women to maintain um, their enrollment in medical school for the future. So the implications are broad. Um, so not only did female enrollment continue to decline, as Flexner had noted was a trend at that time, but again, some of the institutions which educated female students um, were closed, and some of those female-only medical institutions also trained African Americans, Native Americans, and working class students. So these restricted the opportunities for those students as well. And unfortunately, again, assumed that co-educational medical schools would admit female students on an equitable and equal basis. And it's well described that there were some medical schools that had gender-based quotas. So unfortunately, there were no stop gaps in place to prevent that from happening. Um, so chapter 14, um, the implications of the, which address specifically the medical education of African Americans, uh, Flexner reviewed the seven African American schools at, open at that time and argued that only two could remain open and provide a quality medical education. And furthermore, um, he outlined that African American medical education should emphasize health and hygiene. Um, which inadvertently limited the scope of African-American physicians and African-American access to specialty care. Um, so while we recognize that the quality of the schools that were closed was suboptimal, institutions educating Blacks, Native Americans, and women were closed without the creation of alternatives um, or short equal acceptance to non-Black, non-female institutions with a long-term um, consequence of overall limited exposure to diverse medical educations for every student. But beyond medical education in the United States, we recognize that most institutions, including hospitals again, were segregated well through the mid 20th century. So I graduated from Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, um, where we did our clinical rotations at Grady Memorial Hospital. And Grady Memorial Hospital is built in the shape of an H, where on one side you had the white units and you had on the other side the black units and the hospital was segregated and built in that fashion. But the lesser known fact is segregation extended beyond the wards and actually into our pathology spaces in the United States. Specifically, blood banks were segregated through the mid 20th century, where here we see white blood and black blood segregated within a, black, within a blood storage unit. Um, and also our morgues were segregated. Um, so this is a morgue downstairs in our basement at Hopkins. Um, the, the early 20th century, highlighting in this, in this white card, um, which says white, and there's a separate morgue for black patients. Okay, so moving on to the argument for diversity in pathology. As primarily pathologists and basic scientists with limited direct patient interaction, we don't directly see our diverse and underserved patient populations in the clinics or OR. So it can be challenging sometimes um, for us to remind ourselves of our role um, within our practice to emphasize diversity um, as it pertains to our practice, research, um, and our workforce. But I'd like to um, challenge your perception of that. When we think about, again, diversity, we look at uh, increasing workforce diversity with elements that are closely tied to improving patient outcomes, such as patient provider or culturally appropriate care and patient-centered care. So while you know, there may be limited opportunities for our pathologists to engage in these, in, in these, um, in these activities, um, there are numerous other opportunities for and reasons why uh, diversity is important in medicine. Um, we have uh, higher quality care, diversification of clinical trials, well recognized that clinical trials remain um, 
remain uh, limited to certain patients, sub subsets that are that have access to enrollment in clinical trials. So there are well-established racial and ethnic disparities in clinical trial enrollment. Um, and in time of global pa pandemic, COVID-19 has brought the conversation about our role in mitigating socioeconomic, and racial, and ethnic health disparities and, and, and inequities to the forefront. Um, and then obviously increased innovation. It's well established in the non-medical literature that increased innovation comes out of diverse teams because there's a diverse um, set of opinions and perspectives. And then higher quality of care, again, as you have that diverse patient group with different opinions, different perspectives, new insights. And if that's not enough, diversity is profitable. Um, an analysis of 366 public companies by the McKinsey Group, they found that companies in the bottom quartile for both gender and ethnicity and race were statistically less likely to achieve above average financial returns than the average companies in the data set. So if the argument about how, how diversity improves patient care, improves the research that we can engage in, if anything, having the financial aspect should be a driver for you. So moving forward, now that we understand where we've gone and why, why diversity is relevant for us as pathologists, both in our clinical spaces and in our research spaces. Let's move forward and talk about our pipeline into pathology. And to talk about the pipeline, I at least want to introduce that concept. So the pipeline into medicine or the pathway into medicine begins with a pre-primary child with early exposure to science, technology, engineering, um, mathematics careers, and then culminates in a medical profession who has realized their fullest potential. At every educational and career milestone, individuals underrepresented in medicine face evolving pressures with change and increase, which, which change and increase and can challenge their um, their persistence on this pathway and increase the risk of attrition. So some examples of these pressures may include lack of role models or stereotypes at a young age for that pre-primary student or overt conscious bias or unconscious bias for an individual that's at the terminal stages of their career looking for a chairmanship, a chairwomanship or chairpersonship. Um, so with that said, um, I'd like to highlight that the term pipeline is an inherently biased one. It implies a linear pathway into medicine, and it potentially deters or even excludes individuals with diverse and rich life experiences from pursuing a career in medicine. So for us to truly engage in a productive conversation about um, the UIM pathway into pathology, it is important for us to be mindful of the broader um, perspectives and backgrounds of our trainees and individuals who might be coming into our fields. Um, so to further ground our conversation about our pipeline, our pipeline into pathology, let's take a look at the broader diversity landscape in undergraduate and graduate medical education. And just to move forward, I want to introduce the term underrepresented in medicine. Um, this is a term used by the AAMC, um, which stands for underrepresented in medicine, UIM, which means those racial and ethnic populations that are underrepresented in the medical profession relative to the numbers in the general population. So this term is a shift from the from the prior term underrepresented minority, and it represents a positive shift in focus from a fixed aggregation of individuals, uh, specifically African Americans, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, um, to a to a, an evolving group of individuals. So, as you know, for example, in the future, if African Americans are no longer underrepresented as relative to their proportion in the United States population, blacks will be moved out of that UIM um, designation, and then the focus can shift more appropriately uh, to another group. But for the, for the time being, UIM and URM are synonymous because again, um, many, of the, many of the groups that are categorized as underrepresented minorities, Blacks, Hispanics, um, Native Americans are, are underrepresented in medicine. So looking at our um, undergraduate medical education diversity landscape, we see that there are increasing numbers of applications to medical school uh, starting in the 1990s, um, specifically for our Black and African American um, and Hispanic and Latino. And you know, granted, it's, it's a slight increase, but it is increasing. But I would like to look at this data more carefully um, because it can be somewhat misleading. This is the number of applications to medical school. This is not the actual number of acceptees or matriculants. And so what we highlight when we look at this data in greater detail, this is all data published by the AAMC, we see that while the number of applicants specifically for Black or African Americans has increased, we don't, we don't see a concordant increase in the number of acceptees. 
Similarly, we see a similar trend for Hispanic or Latino. And then unfortunately for American Indian or Alaska Native, we see abysmally low um, data, both for the number of applicants for acceptees, highlighting that this is an incredibly underrepresented um, group and we need to focus significant efforts to increase the numbers in, our, um, in the physician workforce. Um, especially again with COVID-19, bringing that conversation about health disparities to the forefront um, and the uh, tragedies that are currently occurring in many of the um, Native reservations. Uh, but the problems not only lie in the recruitment of underrepresented, of individuals underrepresented in medicine, it also in lies with retention. So while we see that the number of women ha in medicine has increased approximately 50%, the number of individuals um, from groups underrepresented in medicine lags behind. And I'd like to bring your attention to this. This pale panel here, um, this pale panel here represents um, the number of total physicians Whereas here we see the number of trainees, I mean, the number of you in the US census population. And you see this waterfall effect where you have increasing numbers at the US census and then US medical graduates, total GME pool, and then it just drops off at the total physician point. And that's the issue where we're having challenges with retention. And to further highlight that, we see that the number of UIM on faculty continues to decrease where we see the number of African-American, Hispanic, Latino, or multi multiracial decreasing compared to the numbers in the US um, graduate medical school, um, US uh, medical graduate pool. And to further highlight again, the gender disparities and racial disparities dis persist at higher faculty ranks. Um, and again, this is data from an, an AAMC analysis and brief highlighting that across the board, there are more males in leadership roles, even amongst those um, and within the African-American and Hispanic groups. So there are more African-American females in, 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 phys, in, in practice, um, but in contrast, there are more African-American males in leadership roles. So those gender disparities persist uh, despite there being more African-American females um, in practice. So highlighting that not only are the racial and ethnic disparities that persist as you and, and, and exacerbate as you go higher in faculty rank, but then the gender disparities are persistent independent of uh, the racial and ethnic disparities. And for those of you that are in the biomedical in the biomedical research workforce, I'd like to highlight that these change that these uh, trends are persistent across the board. So we see in this nice data presented by Dr. Hannah Valentine, uh, the Chief Diversity Officer for the NIH, we see that as the number of um, as as you increase and in, within the as you uh, attain higher career status or progress through education, the number of individuals underrepresented in medicine decreases, um, the number of women decreases, highlighting again that these observations that we see in the medical school and undergraduate medical education are not um, isolated to medical education, they persist uh, within the biomedical research workforce, highlighting again that there are opportunities to um, increase and re recruitment and retention across the board. Um, and this is interesting data published by Ginther et al, um, where they highlighted that after controlling for an applicant's educational background, country of origin, training, previous research reward, publication record, employer characteristics, everything, they found that black applicants remain 10 percentage points less likely than, than whites to be awarded um, NIH research funding. So this could be a reason behind the attrition that you're seeing within the biomedical sciences. Um, and on faculty, but it's an important barrier to recognize and be mindful of, especially when you're thinking about career mentorship for individuals underrepresented in medicine, uh, pursuing a career in academics, whether it be a physician scientist track or a scientist track. But the disparities um, don't are not in, are, are not unique to racial and ethnic background. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to just highlight that socioeconomic diversity remains stagnant um, within the US medical student uh, cohort. So we see this nice data again published in an AAMC analysis and brief that individuals coming from the lowest quintile from socioeconomic status based off of the parental income has remained stagnant within the past 10 years with the top 50th percent uh, percentile coming from individuals with parents having parental income in the top fifth percentile and the top 80th to 95th percentile. So it's really important to be mindful of socioeconomic diversity as well. 
and it impacts their it impacts the medical students risk of attrition as well um, just this highlighting again that with um, with in this blue line we see a student's risk of attrition during the first two years of medical school is directly impacted by their socioeconomic status um, similarly, we see that even when MCAT scores are controlled for, individuals coming from lower socioeconomic status um, are at increased risk of um, attrition independent of their MCAT score. Again, highlighting that diversity, inclusion, and equity initiatives should be mindful of both race and, race and, race and ethnicity and also socio socioeconomic status and recognizing the barriers that these students might face um, as they, as they uh, continue on their pathway. So let's look at some pathology specific data. So this was, my interest in this was prompted by a, a, paper, by a paper published by uh, Kirlin DeVille et al, um, where they highlighted that in 2012, pathology had significantly fewer uh, graduate medical education trainees when compared to other um, black medical, I'm sorry, pathology had significantly fewer black pathology underrepresented Black graduate medical education. Oh my goodness, let's start again. Pathology had fewer black graduate medical education trainees when compared to other specialties, including neurosurgery, anesthesiology, and, and emergency medicine. Um, Hispanics uh, were similarly on the lower end of things, but not significantly lower. So we went forward and did a pathology specific analysis. And we want, I want to first start off by highlighting what we know, which is that pathology has made significant improvements in achieving gender parity um, between 1977 and 2016. Um, we're seeing that there's significant uh, increase in representation of female, almost uh, more than male, more than male uh, in the 29, 2010, uh, 2011 years. Um, so overall, the uh, rate of female pathology resident trainee um, representation has been increasing by a rate of 0.45%, 45% per year, um, and that's been phenomenal. But we'd like to highlight that, that even though we're seeing um, a significant rate of increase in the number of female faculty, um, there's still opportunity for growth. Um, Again, highlighting that there may be some opportunities for um, dedicated uh, retention efforts for these women in pathology. And again, looking at this data more and more carefully, uh, we see that despite these increases, again, the number of practicing pathologists and pathology faculty uh, lags behind the female trainee representation, again, highlighting that opportunity to further increase female pathologist representation. Um, so when we look at uh, race and ethnicity specific data as a whole, UM representation has significantly increased since 1995. Um, however, when you look at the data um, on a more granular level, we see that there's no significant trend for the rate of increase or rate of change per year for Black or American Indian, um, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander individuals. And when we look at uh, Black representation um, more carefully, as we discussed, um, black representation is significantly lower than the representation in the total training pool in the U.S. population. So the take home point is that there are significant opportunities for holistic recruitment and retention offers. Um, and I'd like to highlight that we do see that the uh, black um, number, the number of black pathology residents mirrors their proportion in um, to the number of total medical graduates and total GME pool. So one interpretation of this could be that uh, pathology residency programs are technically doing no worse with recruiting uh, black or URM students into pathology than other medical schools and other, than other um, medical specialties. Um, but however, I'd like to emphasize that other medical specialties such as medicine, pediatrics, ob have significantly more black and underrepresented individuals in medicine um, in their specialties. So there are opportunities to kind of take some of the uh, programs that they've implemented successfully in their specialties to increase representation in pathology. Um, but again, when you look at the terminal points of the um, career pathway for pathologists, for black pathologists, you see the practicing pathologists and pathologists, pathology faculty are at about, are at about 2%, um, highlighting that there's significant opportunities again for retention and recruitment efforts. 
One um, additional interesting thing to note is that when you look at the number of applicants to pathology, that's at 6.3%, which is higher than the number of pathology residents. And so this warrants additional further investigation um, to understand what's going on here. Why are we losing um, black applicants to pathology? Um, or is there, some, is there some potential unconscious bias in the selection process? When we look at the data for faculty uh, by race and ethnicity, again, um, not seeing much significant increase. Um, we're seeing URM faculty as a whole increasing at 0.05% per year, and for Blacks, 0.01% per year. Um, so significant opportunities for uh, retention, retention and recruitment efforts. And to look at the top, to highlight the attrition at a later milestone in the pipeline into pathology department chair status, there's significant gender and racial ethnic disparities that are persistent. So when we look at females, we see 38% of our uh, clinical pathology department chairs are women. We have uh, three total Black or African American department chairs, um, five Hispanic or Latino, um, and we have no American Indian, Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander. So again, opportunities to uh, mentor and endorse and champion for individuals as they get to the higher levels of the career stage. So what, what can we do to expand the pipeline into pathology and increase inclusion and equity at the medical student level? Because again, you, know, you can't get to increasing representation at the chair status without expanding the total number, the total pool of individuals underrepresented in medicine. So I'll highlight one of the efforts that we've done here at Hopkins, which is a rotation for individuals underrepresented in medicine. And unfortunately, this is on hold because of the COVID-19 crisis, um, but we hope that uh, with some creativity and things relaxing, we might be able to expand these opportunities in an online format, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So this rotation is a one month rotation uh, for students who identify as underrepresented in medicine. Um, when the students were, were able to come on site, we would cover student housing and travel, um, and we provide them with a schedule that is tailored to their interest. We provide one-on-one -on -one advising and mentoring. That advising and mentorship is critical because again, when you're thinking about identifying the challenges and the barriers that that underrepresented individuals facing on their pathway into medicine and pathology, you have to mentor and meet with them and understand, you know, what barriers are they facing and what can you as a faculty mentor help that, help that student overcome. Um, and we also have an exit interview to discuss their experiences and better understand we can tailor uh, the future experience for students. And this is, this is a team effort. Um, I'd like to highlight Dr. Alicia Ware, who's been critical in the success of the program. Dr. Tricia Murdoch, again, another faculty. She's Native American. Um, and this is our administrative support, Ms. Sherry Reed, Dr. Annika Winden, uh, Dr. Juan Chumcroso, Dr. Um, Laura Wake, Dr. Ralph Rubin, our department chair, myself, and then Dr. Lissandra Voltaggio. Um, so in addition to our rotation, we have an active outreach program, which unfortunately again is suspended um, for the interim, but we hope to uh, engage in some uh, virtual outreach. Um, so this outreach program was initiated in 2016, and we targeted our outreach um, to institutions that have higher proportions of individuals underrepresented in medicine. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but I'd like to highlight that for these outreach efforts, we have a careers and pathology presentation. So we introduce, you know, career as a pathology, as a careers and pathology as a whole. You know, what do we as pathologists do? Because again, you know, we're talking about pathology, which at baseline is seeing declining U.S. medical student interest. Um, and these, these outreach sessions are not limited to students' interest in pathology. We try and get as many students as possible. Um, so at Morehouse School of Medicine, we meet with the entire first year class. Um, at uh, Meher, we met with the entire third year class. Um, so we, we try to intentionally engage a large student population as possible in order to reach as many. And we highlight again that we focus our outreach efforts on institutions that have higher proportions of individuals underrepresented in medicine, um, because when you look at this data published by AAMC, um, we see that Howard, Meharry, and Morehouse School of Medicine, the three historically black medical schools, have graduated 350 or more black or African American physicians between 1980 and 2012. And when you look at the remainder of the schools on the list, these schools in general have larger graduating class sizes when compared to Morehouse, which for some time had about 50 to 60 students per year, Meharry about 100, Howard, Howard similar. 
Um, so this is just, these are just some photos of our outreach efforts. Um, so this is Dr. Alicia Ware um, giving, our, giving a presentation to Howard. We talk about how our pathologists involved. You know, a lot of them are, you know, first or second year, so they're thinking about, you know, taking step one soon. And so we tailor the presentation to have content that's relevant and important for, and, you know, things that they would have covered at this point in their staging, in their career. Um, this is me uh, giving talk at Morehouse. Um, but our outreach efforts are not restricted to medical students. Um, this is a, an effort that was led by Dr. Trisha Murdoch, again, highlighted over here. Um, she uh, reached out to the Native, Na National Native American Youth Initiative, which provides an intense summer program for American Indian and Alaska Native high school students. And they bring them into DC every summer. And we, uh, worked, at, we worked with them and brought you know, some plastinated organs. We brought a microscope, brought some slides, um, and talked about careers in pathology, but then also talked about going to college and what you need to do in college to go to medical school. Um, so again, uh, be mindful of what the individual needs at that time. So just to highlight the successes of our combined outreach program and rotation, um, nine out of our 20 past rotators have matched into pathology. This is data that was published um, in, an in a, an academic pathology paper uh, written by Dr. Ware. Um, and since then, we had three uh, individuals match into uh, pathology this year. But more important than the outcomes are the feedback. You know, one student said, uh, this is a great way to learn more about the program, receive career guidance, again, increasing equity, and understand more about pathology from an academic perspective. Um, I learned a new appreciation for histology and the disease process. So the subjective feedback was, is just as equally powerful, if not more powerful than uh, the objective feedback with the pure numbers. And to highlight why these efforts are important, um, I don't need to remind everyone, unfortunately, U.S. medical student interest is declining, and pathology is declining. Um, where we're seeing, as of 2020, a 29.8% decrease in the number of U.S. Uh, senior pathology applicants, uh, despite having an increasing number of residency spots. Um, and this is data that we put together um, back in 2018, highlighting that, um, again, uh, U.S. senior interest in pathology is just declining. So our efforts are kind of twofold. Um, they're increasing equity and uh, increasing exposure for individuals underrepresented in medicine to pathology, but then also at baseline, just increasing and generating interest in pathology, as again, we're reaching out to broader audiences. And in a time in a pandemic, again, um, the silver linings, unfortunately, are that there are, there's a renewed focus on you know, health, socioeconomic, and educational inequities. And there's also been an incredible amount of creativity across all fronts. And so as we implemented uh, virtual learning for our medical students quite rapidly and for our residents, uh, we're thinking critically now about how we can use these resources to increase access for students um, who might not have been able to travel for elective rotations uh, for various reasons, such as cost or family, or who alternatively are coming from a school with a small path pathology department. Um, so we're rapidly thinking of ways Ways that we can use these online modalities to increase access and decrease um, inequity. And I just to highlight, uh, this is an early online uh, release uh, publication of senior offered by Dr. Jiang, um, highlighting the various remote re learning resources um, that we can harness to increase equity um, across the board. So we briefly talked about the role of mentorship to inspire, support, nurture our underrepresented students earlier in their career and then as they progress. But that's just one small piece of the picture. Um, so the, the small picture is, you know, at the, at, the, at the institution level, but then also more broadly. Um, and so I just like to highlight uh, some things that are going on more broadly. So this is at the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, and this is in their department of um, ra uh, radiology. So Vanderbilt was at a crisis point in their department with their, where they had no underrepresented in medicine trainees in their training program in 2013. So to address this, they created a tiered and systematic approach to uh, approaching diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, so they focused their tiered approach um, to developing outreach outreach um, efforts similar to what we've done um, here at Hopkins and a rotation program to focus on the uh, residency applicant pool and the residency program. Um, they also uh, supported their, um, their current trainees uh, by establishing um, a diversity lectureship series, highlighting the research and clinical achievements of nationally re renowned underrepresented medicine physicians. 
Um, and they also implemented unconscious bias education to all radiology faculty and residents. Um, they implemented a holistic uh, residency review process, um, which again is critical to ensuring that there is that, that the uh, effects of unconscious bias are limited um, in your in your group in your uh, residency so selection review process. Um, they also established a department of office. Um, a department, departmental office of diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and established um, defined roles for those individuals. And the proof again is in the results. Their number of um, UIM trainees increased from zero in 2013 and six um, in 2019. And more importantly, um, the number of UIM individuals in the total radiology applicant pool um, that showed a significant increase in the number of individuals under, under representative medicine. So it not only has a, had a positive impact on their individual institution, but it had a positive impact on the entire pool as a whole. Um, so again, this is the broader picture um, of what's going on at uh, other institutions and within other departments. And to highlight how our efforts within our pathology department are supported by activities um, more broadly at Hopkins, um, we have a broad health staff diversity council, which has um, individuals from every specialty represented, and they have um, bi-monthly events, which again are unfortunately on hold um, because of COVID, but um, Prior to that, they were having evening sessions where faculty and UIM trainees would just gather and chat. This was this is a group photo here of um, the diversity council um, during an evening session where we had dinner and just chatted. Um, there are established ground round lectureships. Um, there is an established uh, diversity and inclusion conference um, occurring th through the entire university um, system, but then also a smaller uh, diversity conference occurring through the uh, postdoctoral alliance committee. So again, um, our department uh, efforts are just one element of the broad institution-wide efforts, um, which you know again highlights that these need to be tiered and systematic approaches. Um, but what's the big picture? So I took my sign to um, the air. Sorry, my light goes off if I don't move. Um, so I took my son to the Air and Space Museum in Northern Virginia, and he totally missed the space shuttle and the air hangar. So I asked you, what's our big picture in our conversation about effective diversity, inclusion, and inequity efforts? Um, and that's national organizational leadership investment. Um, so while our individual efforts may result in change within our own departments or institutions, in order to truly effectively and radically uh, improve diversity, inclusion, and equity, there needs to be a clear and defined investment from national organizational leadership. And just to highlight a few that are occurring broadly, um, so as the accrediting body of the US and Canadian medical schools, the LCME is leading the way for UME efforts uh, undergraduate medical education efforts for diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, where they're formally um, assessing medical schools undergoing their accreditation process on their efforts to build pipeline programs and establish curricula focusing on cultural competence and healthcare disparities. So very important um, for medical schools at this point to be mindful of formally incorporating uh, these, um, con these, this content into the curricula in order to maintain accreditation. And also for uh, those in the United States, the ACGME is now charging graduate medical education programs to formally assess residents on topics such as cultural competency, um, which naturally means that programs must provide appropriate instruction. Um, so while specialties at the forefront of diversity inclusion, such as pediatrics or internal medicine, have um, significantly more milestones pertaining to these topics, I'd like to just highlight that pathology does have a milestone pertaining to cultural competency. Uh, this falls under interpersonal and communication skills one, patient and family-centered uh, communication. So um, hopefully these, these will continue to expand as we in pathology continue to expand our conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'd just like to highlight that the efforts of the um, Liaison Committee for Medical Education and the ACGME are twofold. Um, on the surface, they normalize the conversation about diversity and inclusion early in medical education with the expectation that the next generation of physicians will be more empowered and better equipped to focus on diversity and inclusion in their own personal practice and research. Um, however, on a um, more deeper level. Uh, these efforts make the learning environment more inclusive for the current UAM trainees. Um, and equally as important, it shows the trainee that the institution recognizes how historically uh, explicit and implicit biased educational environments uh, contribute to the current 
uh, socioeconomic, minority health disparities, and physician workforce underrepresentation. So on multiple levels, this the broad um, uh, mess and why changes are critical. Um, and to highlight, the AMC does have numerous free resources on their website. Um, including how to effectively implement a holistic applicant review process um, at the medical student level, um, and then a roadmap for how to implement um, a diversity and education program. And for those um, in the basic science world, I'd like to highlight the wonderful work that again is being done under the leadership of Dr. Hannah Valentine, the Chief Office for Scientific Workforce Diversity. Um, she created a wonderful web-based resource for diversity and inclusion. Um, again, this is free, um, highlighting the items that we touched on today, um, uh, mentorship, diverse can diversification of the candidate pool, um, holistic and, un and unbiased talent researches, and then um, active outreach and networking. But above all, uh, the push for diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts um, should also include active endorsement and involvement by leaders of the medical, of the medical community. And I want to, again, highlight uh, this uh, statement released by Dr. Francis Collins, um, the director of the NIH, who stated, starting now, when I consider speaking invitations, I will expect a level playing field where scientists of all backgrounds are, are evaluated fairly for speaking opportunities. If that attention to inclusiveness is not evident in the agenda, I will decline to take part, and I challenge other scientific leaders across the biomedical enterprise to do the same. Um, so what are we doing in pathology at a national level? We're rapidly expanding our conversation about diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, as highlighted by the wonderful invitation uh, to speak with you today. Um, so while not endorsing any single organization, and these are certainly not all the efforts that are ongoing, I wanted to highlight just a bit of what's, being, of what's going on at the national level in the United States. Um, so many of you may have seen these two non-peer-reviewed pieces published in The Pathologist, which emphasize not only diversity, but more importantly, inclusion and the importance of early mentorship, um, written by uh, Angela Knott um, and Dr. Valerie Fitou. Um, so I, I advise you to you know, just take a look at them. They're really powerful pieces. Um, recently at the USCAP annual meeting, um, we included a new scientific session which uh, focused on disparities in biomedical research, um, healthcare and gender, healthcare of transgender individuals and medical education. And our pathology leaders are also pushing the conversation forward as well. Um, so Dr. Melissa Upton, the former ASCP president, led the call and wrote an incredibly powerful uh, message in, in addition of ASCP's critical values. Um, publication with the diversity inclusion statement, and she also worked to establish the ASCP diversity inclusion committee, which I'm a member of. Um, so as our pathology societies continue to focus on diversity inclusion to support institution-wide efforts, um, I'd like to again challenge everyone logged on today to continue to think of ways that you can use your individual roles to push the conversation forward, whether it be in the sign out room, the classroom, virtual or in person, um, the research laboratory or your community. Um, so in summary, um, diversity in pathology is critical, again, as we all strive to innovate, increase awareness of and reduce health disparities, diversify clinical trials and provide high quality care. Um, although gender diversity um, has increased in pathology, there's still significant opportunities to retain female trainees at higher ranks. Uh, barriers to recruiting and retaining individuals underrepresented in medicine evolve at each new stage of their career and education, so it's important to be mindful of that. Um, and impactful diversity, inclusion, and equity initiatives may include personalized um, outreach and mentoring, but uh, should also be a component of larger institution and or specialty-wide cultural changes in order to affect the most impactful change. And with that, I'd like to, again, thank Dr. Alicia Ware, who's been instrumental in the success of our rotation and outreach efforts, um, Dr. Uh, Kirtland DeVille and Ms. Rio Weiss, um, for their efforts for helping put together the pathology-specific longitudinal historic, historical data. Um, the members of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Department of Pathology Diversity Committee, including Dr. Tricia Murdoch, Lissandra, Dr. Lissandra Voltaggio, Dr. Annika Winden, Dr. Laura Wake, uh, Juan Troncoso, Ralph Bruban, Administrative Support, um, our patho Pathology Photography Division, who helped us put together a pamphlet about pathology to pass out to our students when we go on these outreach initiatives. And finally, um, our pathology residents, fellows, faculty, and staff for being engaged with our rotators while they've been on site. Um, 
and also my parents who I think logged on. Um, ironically, in a time of uh, social distancing and physical distancing, um, we're able to become closer and engage in activities that we previously weren't able to engage with before. So my parents have logged on today. Um, and with that, I guess I'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. White. That was really eye-opening and uh, very fact-based and objective uh, presentation about some some things that uh, are very very much within our reach to make some differences. So, uh, Mitchell from Wine Prince down the hallway. <laughs> So um, oh, I forgot to give a shout out to our histology staff who logged on here at Hopkins. Um, uh, so what can those of us who don't live in racially diverse areas do to promote new arm participation in pathology? That's a great question. And I think that's where, you know, again, COVID has been an incredible challenge um, and has been incredibly stressful, but I think it's bringing a lot of really creative ideas for how we can increase access for individuals that are, um, not in diverse areas. I think for individuals who don't live in diverse areas, um, you know, certainly there's a need for individuals to go to under-resourced settings. And I think um, utilizing these online platforms certainly, I mean, as the technology becomes as become as, as the technology becomes more readily available, it may be easier to, you know, have a Zoom class session uh, remotely for you know, an individual that wants to reach out to an inner city high school or a really rural high school or a high school out in Alaska, um, those opportunities might become more readily available. Um, and, and certainly, I think it's, it's mindful that it's not just racial diversity, it's socioeconomic as well. So for individuals that might live in the Midwest where there's not a lot of um, UIM individuals, there is significant uh, socio socioeconomic um, inequity. And so I think there are other opportunities to be mindful of the different ways that diversity can look, um, the different uh, challenges that the students can be facing. Um, when you think about the education inequity that's that we're seeing right now, I mean, not every student has, you know, a, an iPad or a laptop to work with at home, and so you have some students that their education right now is completely halted. And so, thinking about ways that you can um, engage those students is, is, is that have socioeconomic inequities is another opportunity, even if you you know you're not looking at racial diversity. Um, so I think I. I think I saw that the first question is from um, Shaka Padilla and says, current programs are usually focused on high school and undergrads. Is there any focus on trying to recruit postgrads in STEM? That's a good question. Um, to my knowledge, I have not heard of any. I will say that we have, um, Here at Hopkins, we have a pathobiology PhD program, and we do engage with our postdoc students and you know, try and encourage some of them to pursue uh, you know, medical school and uh, go into pathology. Um, but I'm not as familiar with um, individuals at the postdoc level, um, programs targeting those students. But that's another really great um, point. I think, um, yeah, I'm not as familiar with programs targeting postdoctoral students. But that's another really great opportunity. Um, and again, we, for, for uh, I would say also for uh, faculty recruits um, coming out of a postdoc program is, is certainly a, a good place to look. Yeah. All right, the next question from Gaith Droby. Are you aware of any data that surveyed why retention is low with underrepresented individuals? No, that's the, so that's the next step. Um, we're not sure. And I think the same thing for women as well. Um, not sure why there are retention, why there are challenges to retention. Um, and so I think that's the next step of kind of sorting out the data. And that might include, you know, more broad surveys, um, looking at promotion rates. Um, you know, we see that there's a, a, a there's steep drop-offs at the assistant to associate and then associate the full professor level. So, you know, at how long are UIM individuals staying at the assistant level and then are they leaving at the assistant to associate promotion point, um, and then what are the reasons why? Um, I think that's the next step um, to better understand how we can support and re retain these individuals. Great. Uh, the next one is from Russell Broadus, our chair at UNC, and he said, thank you for bringing up socioeconomics. Both of my parents were college faculty in the liberal arts, so I grew up in a family in which education was valued. 
which obviously benefited me. How do we devise strategies to develop these values in education? That's a tough answer. Um, so I guess, so the question, so I guess the question is, how do we, are you, are you asking, how do we target these students that are, are at our at, that are at uh, socioeconomically underserved schools and how do we encourage them? I'm unsure, but I think uh, right. perhaps it's, it's looking at, you know, what are, what are some of those um, larger socioeconomic um, barriers to, you know, early promotion of the value of, of education? That's a tough one. I mean, I think, I, I don't know. Um, but I think, again, that, that's where, you know, if you have a parent that's working two jobs um, and you're in, in, you know, you might have limited child care or you're sending your child to, you know, whatever child care that you can get and it might not be, you know, the best you know, child care. I think that's where, you know, we as physicians and as medical professionals can go into the schools that are in these historically socioeconomic underserved areas and to serve as a role model and mentor for these students. Um, again, you know, the, the efforts don't have to be focused on um, UIM individuals. Definitely, there are well-established schools that are in zones that are in underserved zip codes. Um, so targeting those uh, schools for your efforts, I think, would be um, low-hanging fruit and could help uh, at least support, you know, if you support some students, that's, you know, a start. But I, I don't know, you know, and again, it's, you know, how do you help support the parents? I mean, I think it's, it's multifactorial. Absolutely, and it's it's a big, big uh, multifactorial issue. So, um, thank you for that answer. Uh, our next question is from DeAndreas Williams. Um, there have been several programs available to students entering medical school that involve committing to family medicine or other specialties. Has there been any discussion of programs like this for pathology? To my knowledge, no. Um, and I think that's that's one. <laughs> Family medicine and internal medicine, those programs, again, highlight the effective efforts that the, the effective efforts to increase UIM representation in those specialties. Um, to my knowledge, that hasn't been a conversation in pathology, but that certainly would not be an unwelcome one. Um, I think there are many opportunities and we can be as creative as we can and kind of borrow uh, effective mechanisms from other specialties. Yeah, that's a very good idea, actually. Um, thank you for the pre amazing presentation. Have we explored the presence of racism and gender bias stereotype in pathology? Are they still present? Are they still currently being experienced from Emmanuel Garcia? That's a good question. So there was a recent paper published by um, Dr. Mortison et al. from the Harvard group, and they noted that their, UI, their um, UIM uh, applicants to their program um, had fewer research opportunities as applicants um, and fewer had uh, AOA status and um, their step scores were lower. With that said, there are other paper, there, there's other data in the literature that suggests that the AOA selection process uh, may be biased. Um, and I don't, I can't, I don't have the reference off the top of my head, but um, there's certainly uh, studies that have looked at uh, racial bias where individuals underrepresented in medicine are underrepresented in the AOA status even uh, when um, grades and performance and academic performance have been controlled for. Um, so that's one uh, opportunity for bias in the residency selection process where you rely on AOA status, but that's an inherently biased mechanism. It's well established that um, exam scores can be inherently biased as you have individuals coming from backgrounds where uh, they might not have as much exposure to these examinations. Um, and then therefore perform lower, but then as we all know, step exams correlate uh, very poorly with overall uh, future career pathway, and, uh, and and they're not a part, you know, they're not uh, indicative of future success. Um, so, you know, I think on one hand, the transition to a pass fail step one might mitigate some of those effects of bias from the step scores, but on the other hand, from personal experience, I graduated again from Morehouse School of Medicine. It's a lesser known school. Um, I'm pretty sure that my step score helped me uh, get some interviews at some places. So I think it's a double-edged sword. And I think um, 
you know, there, there are some suggestions that there are biases in the AOA status, um, letters of recommendation, uh, it's well established that there, in some specialties, that there may be gender bias in the ways that uh, letter writers write letters. Um, so I think there are biases, but I think that's where in, in implementing a holistic review process can help mitigate those effects. Wow, well, yeah, that's, that's a lot of good information and, and things to think about. I think particularly there's very good data on the, the bias and recommendations and how our language is coded to um, kind of give away some of the details of someone's gender or uh, otherwise. So that's a great thing to look at. All right, so we have a number of questions. I'll try and get through as many as possible. From Dana Bostic, are there any recruitment efforts for URM medical school slash pathology program candidates directly from the clinical lab? For example, active recruitment or mentorship of URM medical laboratory scientists within the lab with an interest in furthering their education? That's an excellent idea. That's an excellent question. Um, so we, so at Hopkins, we just, we partnered with a local community college um, and we have a histotechnologist program. Um, but then we also uh, bring the students on site and myself and Dr. Ware will engage with the students um, at least, you know, every, every cycle um, to talk about careers in medicine and pathology. Um, as far as a formal pipeline program, I think ASCP on the uh, diversity inclusion committee is actually exploring opportunities for formal mentorship programs for uh, students in these medical technology programs um, to support them as they progress through their career and help them explore um, either um, uh, professional training either in the form of PhD or going on to medical school. Um, so I think that's something that the ASCP uh, diversity inclusion and that diversity inclusion committee is actively, uh, is actively exploring. Uh, Tasha James has another excellent question. I think you're um, you're in a good position to talk about. So she asks, do you believe if pathology was included more in the core curriculum of medical students, especially schools with greater numbers of URM students, that it could possibly increase the pathology residency applicants? Yeah, I think that's like the, the, the hot debate right now. So we, so we transitioned to an integrated curriculum um, in the early 2000s, and the role of pathology uh, somewhat fell to the wayside where we lost the separate dedicated pathology course and pathology kind of was split out into uh, multiple organ system-based blocks. Um, and so I think you're right in that pathology has been parsed out and removed some, to some extent, and, and its prominence has been removed to some extent from the core curriculum. And we're, we might be seeing the downstream effects of that where we're seeing decreased interest in pathology as a specialty. So I think um, a lot of uh, pathologists are thinking creatively about how to bring pathology back to the forefront. Um, and ironically, again, with COVID, a lot, you know, here we had a virtual surgical pathology rotation and within six weeks we had 24 rotators. And on, I think on any given year, we don't have 24 rotators. So, Ironically, we're getting more exposure in time of social distancing, and so I think there are opportunities to explore some of the um, interim pathology curricula and how we can uh, maintain them when students come back on site um, in, a, in a somewhat abbreviated format, but to at least um, bring pathology back to the forefront. Excellent. So I want to go ahead and pause right now. It's one o'clock, which is the end of our scheduled time. Uh, thank you all so much for signing on and having an active discussion. Um, this is really eye-opening and enlightening stuff, and I'm so glad that we could bring it to this broad audience. Um, that said, Dr. White, there are a number of more questions in the chat, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you have time, if you'd like to take a few more minutes and, yeah, and hang over on. those. I'm happy to stay, um, but please everybody else, um, thank you again for joining. And we're really glad that we could all have this discussion together. Um, so with that said, we'll continue on with some of these questions that are very good. Let's see, okay, so for underrepresented black slash Hispanic students, has the program reached out for partnerships with medical schools in the Caribbean? So that's, so, that's a good question. I think it gets, it, I think it, it's, 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 a, it's a challenging answer um, because the question is, no, I'm sorry, let me, to, let me to, to, if you can unmute yourself, is your question, um, the uh, 
U.S. Caribbean medical schools or? Um, so they do say U.S. Or Canadian medical schools. Pardon? They did mention U.S. after Caribbean. Okay, so U.S. medical, U.S. Caribbean medical schools. Okay, so no, we have not reached out to U.S. Caribbean medical schools, and that's a good idea because you know, thinking back to my personal experience, um, you know, some of the advice I got as an undergraduate was to you know consider a DO or consider um, going to a Caribbean medical, a U.S. Caribbean medical school. And so you're right in that a um, there probably there are more UIMs at those institutions. Um, so that's an excellent idea, and I think that will be something we can explore in the future. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think that is, that's, a, that's another um, kind of avenue uh, to, to access some of those students. Yeah. Um, so Tasha James asked, do you believe that the decline in pathology residents who are URM could be due to the pressures of those URM to aim to be in special, specialties with higher paying salaries? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, and I, I don't know the answer. So, but I can tell you from personal experience, and I went to Morehouse School of Medicine, um, a decent number went into non-primary care specialties, even though Morehouse School of Medicine um, is a step, was established to uh, train future primary care physicians. Um, and you're right, you know, it's, it's well established that URM students have, have statistically higher um, med medical school and educational debt when compared to non-UIM individuals. Um, so keeping that in mind, you know, when you're thinking about going into primary care where you're looking at $90,000 and $300,000 $300, worth of medical education debt, internal medicine or family medicine doesn't look as attractive anymore. So you're right in that, you know, I think that's a part of the conversation. Um, I think that's why uh, the U.S. Loan Forgiveness Program was established to um, encourage students who are coming from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds or um, individuals who am who have higher um, medical school debt um, to consider a specialty in primary care um, rather than and not be lost to um, a, a specialty. Great. Um, so I think that's wound down on the questions. Um, so we'll go ahead and stop it here. And thank you again. And I hope everybody has a good day and stays safe and um, well. Thank you again, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Marissa.